we've changed our farm and how as an individual the impact you can have. So my farming journey began as a daughter of dairy farmers here in Somerset. So I haven't moved very far, just 20 minutes from where I've grown up, but my parents' journey was around the organic farming movement and there were pioneers within that movement and that had a massive impact on my view of agriculture. But we all have these single events in our lives that often change our direction. Now, at the age of 18, I was all set to go to the University of Liverpool. I was very excited. And then my dad was diagnosed with a brain tumour and he passed away a year later. And it made me really take stock about what I wanted to do with my life. Suddenly at 18, I had this huge amount of responsibility helping my mum run a farm with you know, my youngest brother was six. And it allows you to look at something and think about a different journey you might take. So I changed my mind, <laughs> as we're allowed to do, and I went and studied conservation. That's something that's always been really close to my heart about caring for the land. But I worked in conservation for a number of years and I loved it, but I just felt something wasn't right. I was hearing continual criticism of farming. And I thought, hold on, we can do something better here. We can farm in a different way. We don't need to be sort of seen as this negative industry. So I returned to the land. So we gained the tenancy at Horner Farm in 2018. And the farm was, if I'm polite, in sort of industrially managed. It was intensive arable, intensive chickens, intensive courses randomly um, and so we are in a journey of recovery on our farm so we now have permanent pasture and herbal lays and very much the ethics our ethics wanted to drive us in a different direction for this farm it sits a really important place in the landscape it's right next to an ancient woodland triple si so we needed to change what was going on there reversing biodiversity decline. We follow a model called agroecology. There's lots of different sort of elements to it, but just to touch on it, it's about delivering healthy food for everyone, and that's nutrient-dense food, so food that is grown in a healthy environment. It's recognising local knowledge and putting importance on that local knowledge and learning from it. And it's working with our natural ecosystem. So this is about not changing our using nature as it is, not trying to change it, and listening to it, so we're learning from nature. And it's also small farmer-centred, as rural communities. It's about having human welfare as part of it, so fair pay, recognising the local knowledge, and recognising that we are a skilled job. And then animal welfare. It's allowing animals to exhibit their natural behaviours, not putting them in intense conditions, in barns, but allowing them to exhibit this behaviour. So this is a flyover of our farm. We took this in 2018 in the summer, we moved in. As you can see, a lot of the fields are quite large and obviously predominantly grassland, but it allowed us to see a different perspective of the farm. And going back about the map, we looked at the map of 1850 of our farm. And we found a huge number of hedgerows had been removed, huge numbers. So we're on a bit of a mission. We're about halfway through replacing every single hedgerow that was on that map in 1850. We've put in wood pasture, silver pasture, traditional orchard, and we're really excited to have just received some funding for hay meadow restoration, so seed, reseeding areas. Yeah. So we needed to look at the foundations of our farm. So the soil is the foundation of the ecosystem, so how can we support this healthy structure of soils and store carbon and protect our microbiology? So covering bare soil, we don't allow bare soil on the farm, so minimal or no-till if we're reseeding our herbal lays. 
natural fertilizers only, so no inputs at all. And this is manure from the live animals grazing, and we'll get a little bit from the barns, and then also green manure. So we've used psyllia in our herbal lettuce plants. Now, the journey began because I started to take responsibility for my impact as a farmer. So how long can we carry on on this trajectory? You know, they say that in the East, we've got 60 harvests left. You know, that's shocking. Like, what's, what's going to happen in the future? So we know we have to change the way we farm, and that is farming with our environment, not trying to change it, work with it. So we started to question bad practice. You know, we don't feed our animals. We rely on the grass, the grass essentially. But we were feeding mineral buckets. And suddenly we looked at these mineral buckets and they had soil and palm in. You know, this is, and it's hidden all the time. It's hidden and that's really hard as a farmer. So we went back to our supplier and we said, that's not acceptable. We want you to produce us a mineral bucket without those. And they did. So if we start to have these little conversations, we can start to build a bigger movement. And then it's about keeping the right animals. So this is, I mean, I love native breeds, so these are animal horns. And, you know, it's about putting the right animal in the right place. There's no point in me having a huge continental cow that needs feeding. They're not going to work for us. And then diversity in our farming systems. So this is where we think about listening to nature. So modern farming has built businesses around monoculture systems. And these aren't resilient. We see the way disease has come in with ash dieback and woodlands on the menders, which are predominantly ash. We're losing them. What, what's, and that's exactly the same in a farming business. So diversity protects us and our natural world. So we want to promote that. And then another example about listening to nature that I like to talk about is weed control. So it's a plant creeping thistle. As farmers, we legally have to control it but we control it by driving a tractor and, and cutting the thistles. But creeping thistles are actually showing you that the ground is compacted. So then we drive a tractor over it and we compact the ground further. It all just seems a little bit backwards at the moment. And then we have animal diversity, which really does actually link in in terms of the rewilding side of things. Hopefully. So a new exciting rival on the farm in the next few weeks, which I might spend my days chasing after. We've got some pigs coming. Not how you traditionally keep pigs, they're gonna roam our pastures, hopefully, and not breaking out. Um, their goal is to disturb soil, allowing new species to, like, to come in, and they're breaking up the surface compaction. Sheep, they get a bad reputation, but they're the golden hoof. They can be used, that is, you know, the brilliant fertilizer, and areas of shorter sward are important in a diverse system. So the cattle, they have varied sport, they help create varied sport type. Their trampling action is really important in terms of trampling seed in, and they're a natural fertilizer. Goats, I do spend my days chasing my goats around. So they target dominant species such as the thistles and the dogs. So they're a natural solution to the herbicides and the fossil fuel use. Business to diversify because they target different species so we can make more, essentially, from the land. Chickens, they help clean our pastures. They're lowering flight populations, which means we don't need to use insecticides on our animals. And they're also fertilizers of soils. And really importantly, us, we're part of the circle. They're a nurturing role. We offer a nurturing role. We can target certain species in the management in terms of conservation and agriculture. And then integrating trees. So this is something that's really important to me. It's about the right tree in the right place. So we have two forms. We have wood pasture and silver pasture. They have massive benefits for wildlife and farm animals. And as climate change is coming in, we cannot understate the importance of having trees in our agricultural systems. Animals have heat stress. And that is something we really need to be aware of as farmers. It allows us to be economically diverse, it has huge soil health benefits, and three-dimensional shape to our habitats. And then diversity of income. So we want to have diversity in our farming system so we can build diversity of income, so we can be a sustainable business. 
This allows us resilience against market changes and the strength to withstand disease such as TB in our cattle. And so we're building diversity on our farm and that's multiple businesses as well. It's not just us. So we've got a farm shop that's run by my brothers, allowing them to stay in the local area. We have food events which are run by the Wild Pear, we're a local catering company. We have a community interest market garden with by Veg, and we have an adventures company that are based on the farm. And then our community impact. It's really important for us that people access the outdoors. You know, if we're talking about what people care about, we need people to be able to access the outdoors. Not only is our welfare for us, but it's also about reconnecting us to the land and the nature. And so many people say they love bumping into the goats, you know, while they're out on the footpaths. And they're starting to understand the connections with everything. But it's also about if we have a healthy environment on our farm, we're benefiting our wider community. And then just a, we wanted to, obviously, our aim was to mitigate against the climate change. So we needed an evidence base to show that we were doing this. So we did a carbon calculator. So I measured everything that was going on in the farm to the amount of plastic used, to the animals, to the, all the diesel burnt. It took me quite a long time. So in 2020, we emitted 75 tonnes of CO2. So I thought, okay, I looked, put into this calculator the changes we could make. And one of the things we do is we measure our soil. So we measure our, our organic matter in our soil that is an indicator of the change in your organic matter can indicate how much carbon you could be sequestering. So we put a plan in place and our ambition was by 2022 to be carbon neutral essentially. But something really incredible happened, much quicker than I was expecting. And this is definitely about trusting in nature. So this year we've got our soil results back and we have built a 1% soil organic matter in 12 months. Now that's, we were aiming for 0.05%. And what that meant in our calculation is we're now predicted this year to sequester 605 tonnes of CO2. And this is on a single farm. That is essentially made the households of Horner and Luckham, my two local villages, carbon neutral. And imagine if every farm in the UK did this. <laughs> So, just to end, I want to see a different future for farming. I want to see one where nature is put at the forefront of our decisions, not just about what it can do for us, but about the role that we play within it and the balance that we can find. And then recognise that we could be really positive. We hear so much negative energy around the impact we are having, but we can turn it around as individuals and we can rebuild that connection with our earth. And then how animals can be integrated into farming systems for the benefit of all. And then one thing that's really important for me is about having a localised food system that benefits the many, not the few. We need to produce food that everyone in my local community can afford and can have access to. Now, my son is a budding entomologist, so we spend many hours out in the fields trying to find all sorts of creatures. But I just wanted to end on, you know, my biggest driver behind all of this is, is my children. I want them to have the opportunity to follow their dreams. Thank you.